This is the Defenders Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We're back with episode two of Hawkeye, Hide and Seek. Wait a minute. Aren't you Hawkeye? Look, I'm not trying to cause a scene here, all right? Out of respect. Whatever the hell this is, but I'm plumb out of patience. So you got two choices, you understand? I could take this, pretend sword, and you pretend to die. And I take that suit. Or I'm going to real punch you. And you're going to real fall down. And I'm going to take that suit. Welcome back, fellow defenders, to our chat about Hawkeye, episode two, Hide and Seek. I am one of your hosts, Derek. Yes, welcome back, fellow defenders. I am one of your other hosts, John. Yes, we are in episode two, Hide and Seek. Thank you so much. Welcome back if you you just took a break and watched episode two and have decided to unpause uh, this podcast. But we're going to go again, spoiler filled in. Derek, do you want to tell us who gave us what? on this episode with the details. Absolutely. This episode was written by Elisa Clement. She's written for a number of shows uh, over the years, including Sorry for Your Loss, uh, which starred Elizabeth Olsen. Ah, excellent. Our our Wanda Maximoff. Um, And that show, Sorry for Your Loss, also featured episodes written by Hawkeye lead writer Jonathan Igla. That's well. Ah, so they, they know each other well. They certainly do. Yes, absolutely. Uh, this episode, as I mentioned last time, is also directed by uh, Reese Thomas, who directed episode one. John, do you want to give us the synopsis for... Hawkeye, Episode 2, Hide and Seek. Sure. After the events of the night before, Kate Bishop takes Clint Barton back to her apartment, but she has left a trail to her own home which is attacked by the tracksuit mafia. The pair are forced to evacuate the apartment after a Molotov cocktail sets Kate's home on fire, which prevents them from taking the Ronan suit away from the scene of the fire. Trying to get off-grid, Kate takes them to her aunt's apartment where she can rest and patch up her battle scars. Meanwhile, Clint tries to recover the Ronin suit. While unsuccessful, he has a LARPer lead on where the Ronin suit may have gone. The next day, Clint returns to his hotel and sends his children back home, promising to return home by Christmas Day. He has six days and counting. With the kids on the plane, he escorts Kate to her mother's company, Bishop Securities, then heads over to Central Park for some hey nonny nonny <laughs> and live action role playing as he fights to the death a firefighter named Grill to recover the Ronin suit. With the suit in his possession, he looks to contact the Russian mafia, believing he can sort out the mess created by Kate and be back in home in time for Christmas. Later that evening during dinner, tensions rise as Kate tries to prove that Jack Duquesne was involved in Armand's death, but her mother Eleanor is unconvinced. So Kate decides to settle the matter by challenging Duquesne to a fencing duel, to prove he is a liar about his sword skills. She does, but her mother remains unconvinced. She leaves the apartment unsettled by an offer of an Armand III butterscotch from Jack, which convinces her further of his involvement in his uncle's murder. In the taxi home, she tries to contact Barton, not knowing that he has allowed himself to be captured by the tracksuit mafia. She tracks down Barton's location, but ends up being captured herself. As the pair are tied to Fairground Rides, the gang informs their boss, Maya Lopez, a.k.a. Echo, of Hawkeye and Kate Bishop's capture. Spoilers for who that is at the end of the episode, John. Well, I thought I might as well because I hadn't a clue when I saw it. I just, they kind of like their Dr. Dre's, to be honest, um, sort of the beats. But um, yeah, no, I I had to sort of, um, I I wasn't quite sure who it was, to be honest, uh, when I first saw it through. And uh, although second time and having uh, looked it up, um, I I guess the hand around the... um, the diaphragm or of the speaker mm-hmm. was um that was a nice little touch i thought and okay. um, and uh but yeah i mean initially i was actually thinking it was potentially natasha's um uh sister and i was just thinking but it doesn't look like her um, and I think, I may, yeah, yeah so i was just 
And maybe she just changed her hair, you know, dyed it black now rather than being blonde, just because of the Russian mafia connection. So, um, yeah, uh, it was a good surprise to yes. have Echo again. Uh, you know, really giving that that New York street level um, sort of baddie or antagonist here. And mm-hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, we're getting closer and closer to getting Daredevil. <laughs> I know, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, <laughs> um, which would be awesome. Yes. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed this episode, especially that ending. That, that Just seeing um, Maya Lopez. I, I knew she was an upcoming figure. I know she potentially, there's rumors that she has her own show on, in the works as well mm-hmm. um, within Disney+. Plus. So we know that potentially she's going to be the um, kind of antagonist that becomes kind of gray area, morally, morally ambiguous kind of, and then becomes a protagonist of her own show later. Mm-hmm. So it was interesting to see that. But overall, this episode was just fantastic kind of lead on from episode one. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad they released both in the same day, but it was, yeah. they clearly weren't supposed to be because uh, they replayed the end of the first episode in the second one. It's not, yeah. it's not made as a movie, um, but it made sense because you released it just before Thanksgiving and hit Christmas if you do two in one day and then uh, one a week for the next four weeks. Uh, so very smart, but, uh, but great to see the character right at the end of the episode. Obviously, we'll see much more of uh, of her next episode but yes. because we saw for about two and a half seconds on screen. And as John said, uh, he had watched the episode before me and said, someone appears at the end. I don't know who it is, but it seems really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so now he knows. And it is really exciting. A character uh, created uh, in the Daredevil comics. Um, Echo. Yes. So, uh, we will learn more about it. We won't talk much about her in this episode here, but uh, it was an interesting reveal anyway. Um, let's get into our top three arrow points for this episode. First up, let's talk about LARPing in a Ronin suit uh, for our first arrow point for this episode. Um, all kind of kicks off uh, as Clint goes back to Kate's apartment and gets the full lowdown of uh, of what's happened, how she got the yep. suit. I love that she just lays it on the line. I also love how it plays in the alleyway where he asks her all the question and she is so overwhelmed by the fact that her hero, the one that inspired her to take up the bow and arrow, is standing in front of her that she can't even speak. And then when they get back to the apartment, eventually she starts being able to tell him everything and everything that's happened. Yeah, it, it, it's really a great opening. Um, I loved... Um, just the whole pitter patter between Clint and Kate, um, in, in this episode. Um, and it's really, it, it, it just kicks off in, in this opening scene. I, I love the moment where, um, you know, she's saying, I'm considered one of the world's greatest archers. And Clint just says, are you one of them? Yeah. <laughs> Move on kind of thing, you know? Um, it's just, you know, the fact she get wants him to sign her bow. Uh, it, it's just really, really good. It is. It, it's almost um, referencing the first episode's title. You know, you should never meet your heroes. Yeah. I, I really like just loved this whole pisser passer between the two of them all, all the way through mm. uh, the episode. So, um, I, this. At, at Kate's apartment as well. You know, there's a bit of maybe um, disappointment from Kate's side as well with this whole thing where, um, you know, with this um, fire that happens in Kate's apartment, she wouldn't be disappointed by the absolutely fantastic throwback of the Molotov cocktail. I loved that, that scene. Was amazing. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that was proper kind of, you know, uh, senses of what a a ninja it Mm. was really really cool just the fact that he had to smash the window before catching them always have and throwing it back at them was just a fantastically done shot yeah really nicely done um but i i I kind of like the post um fire as well where she goes are we going back to your secret base are we going back to you know the 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 avengers secret hideout Mm. and it's like no that's been decommissioned effectively we're going to get you some rubbing alcohol um you know some bandages and so on and she's kind of like oh okay <laughs> you know so it was it was going to be a bit more yeah. subterfuge yeah. and so on and i i really like that dynamic i love that through through this episode absolutely and and he does point out something that i kind of forgot tony totally sold avengers terror in the center of new york and the Avengers campus that was built outside of New York has been destroyed in the attack yeah. from that. Yeah. So there actually is no Avengers center point anymore nope. at all. I, I kind of forgot about that until he, he put it 
in those plain words. No, Tony sold that a few years ago. I was like, oh yeah, there's no Avengers anything left. Yeah. We don't even know if there is an Avengers left. That is true. Like, we don't know the the current. This is the furthest into the MCU we've ever been. There, there, there's no Tony Stark left. Well, that is very true. You know? <laughs> Spoilers <Yeah>. for Endgame. <laughs> Tony Stark wasn't the Avengers. Oh, he was. No, uh, he was a member of the Avengers. True. Nick Fury true. set it up. Uh, okay, let's not get into who, <laughs> yeah, yeah. who I, made what with Avengers. I thought Avengers. you were going to say Captain America. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Members. For me, this this opening scene and it just underpins the 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 one liners and the the quick yeah. wit yeah. and the of the writing staff here and the, particularly of how it's delivered by the two main characters. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's so quick, it's so dry humor, and it's it is like an arrow, blink and you'll miss it. It kind of comedy, um, like we didn't even call it out earlier. The in the uh, Rogers the musical. The urinal, the graffiti. Thanos was right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Again, that's like true. it was just that blink, very quick. Ha, that was a good one, and yeah. then you move on. It's this very sharp wit, mm-hmm. and we see it from both of them. Like it, it's her trying to be Clint, and then like the example you gave, which is I'm considered to be one of the best archers. <laughs> exactly. Are you one of those people? Like it's just again, and then it's just but. It's just gone. Like, if you, yeah. if you don't kind of chuckle there, you're moving on. Yeah, it's almost as well that same dynamic, like, in Up with the old guy and, and the kids. Mm-hmm. You know, okay, not quite the same a- age gap, but it, it's just that that slightly skeptical view of, of the world or what she's doing from Clint as well. You know, um, when did everyone start saying, I love you all the time when she's <laughs> on the phone to her mom? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's just that, it's that real kind of weariness about yeah. some of the things. Um, and I, I, the dynamic is really good like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Just even the idea that it's a 22 year old running around in his, in his, uh, ninja costume, as he's calling yeah. it, uh, going and uh, going being a vigilante, you know, it's like, Oh, what have I got to put up with? Yeah. And Kate Bishop running upstairs going, Oh my God, Hawkeye's in my apartment. He's in my apartment. He's actually here. And then runs upstairs, grabs the boat for him to sign. You know, she's totally fangirling over, uh, over Hawkeye being there. I also loved a good comedy touch as well. Um, we talked about, uh, Clint throwing the Molotov back, but I love that that Kate tries to show off how great she is with a bow. She does a great shot on a Molotov outside. Yes. And then mm-hmm. it's the fire extinguisher, which bounces off everything in the room, and you think, wow, there's going to be a cool comic book moment, but it bounces out the window and lands in the street, <laughs> uh, covering the street and, yeah. and, and stuff. It feels like, wow, she's going to put out the fire with a bow. That's awesome. Oh, no, not at all. Yeah. Uh, nice little comedy moment. And that's what I enjoy. So, like, and I'm going to put it out now. Like, the we're getting a, a nice mix of action, a nice mix and mix of kind of family drama to mm-hmm. a degree. Buddy cop. Let's call it a buddy cop at this point. Um, and then you get this comedic kind of quick one liners and kind of scenarios, like you said with the fire extinguisher. There's even the bit with with. When are we getting the special arrows as well? Yeah. You know, the, the trick arrows. Yeah, the trick arrows is yes. like really good. There are no things as trick arrows. Mm. Um, but they, for me, the, 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 they, I'm glad they put the story of the Ronin suit to bed by the end of this or by actual midpoint of this because, um, they, it was, <sighs> Like, I wanted to see where it was going next, and if it was just going to be six episodes of them chasing the Ronin suit yeah. and getting into hijinks, <laughs> I was like, all right, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm here for it, but I'm not going to, like, I'm, I'm in the car, I'm going to the destination, but, like, I, I'm not going to enjoy the, the, the view. Yeah, um, in all honesty, it felt like it got really quite serious by the end with, yeah. uh, <laughs> with, uh, Echo, um, the, she looked like no messing, yeah. no yes. messing. Um, because the, the, when he goes back to the apartment and the, the suit's gone, by the way, the, again, seeing Clint weave his way up, you were reminded he is a, a shield agent. Mm-hmm. Cause he's just, he, he's in, he's up, he, the jacket's on, everything's done. Um, and then he gets up to the top there, no suit, comes back down, sees the, uh, NYC LARP association. Uh-huh. And I was like, Oh, they're, oh, they're going this route. Okay. Okay. Let's see. And he goes to the, 
the the New York City Central Park and for the LARPing um, <laughs> session that day until mm-hmm. midnight. Yeah. So two quick <laughs> things on this. I'm glad they didn't make fun of it. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think look, LARPing is it's it, it's real live action D and D essentially. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons. If for yeah. anyone who doesn't know what D and D is, um. And it, it's essentially that. Yeah, you're just role-playing a fantasy world, yeah. a character that you've created. Yeah. And i personally never done it. I do, do Dungeons and Dragons. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it's a fun thing. It's just like a basically it's a real-life video game. So many other movies, TV shows use role-playing nerd kind of geek culture as a punchline. Yeah. Um, much to Derek's chagrin, look at Big Bang Theory. Yeah. Um yeah, <laughs> he just I, I will never look at, uh, at exactly, and, cl- and thankfully it's over and been cancelled. Yes. So it's great. It's true, but they they played this with a lot of respect. Like mm-hmm. it was fun. He could have gone in, as he said, this is going to end two ways when he meets the guy in the Ronin suit. Yeah, it's like I can pretend to kill you, and you can give me the suit, or you can try and hit me with that sword. I punch you and take the suit. They played it well. They yeah, didn't absolutely. kind of make fun of it. They, they did make fun of it, but they made fun of it on the sense of it was an outsider who doesn't yes, that is exactly. do uh, LARPing, uh, to, who just didn't get it. Who's, who, as he said, I mean, he goes, when, you know, we need a trial by combat, he goes, I fought Thanos. I thought this was <laughs> hilarious, and I, I don't think it. I, but I agree with you. It, it wasn't disrespectful towards that's, it. Sorry, that's it, probably the better it, way of putting it. It, it. it was. It was the, the 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 contrast of someone that doesn't do it with the people that are really into it, yeah. and he just doesn't get it. But yes. in the end, he actually does mellow because Grill is kind of like. Oh come on, man! Please just do this, you know. He because he is human and he he's not disrespecting. He just doesn't get it. And then in the end, he's like he gives Grill his moment of of ultimate power uh, in in the trial by combat. Mm-hmm. And I I thought it was fabulous. Uh, this whole thing, uh, the the slow mo, even the the little um, the. The goodness where he says, where and in fact, I think he says something else. Um, but they they dub the the the, the slowed down um, yeah. uh, goodness instead of mm-hmm. oh goodness instead of ouch, which I thought was really good. That was yes. a nice little yeah. touch. I really I really like that slow mo battle as well because it is it is kind of saying this is Hawkeye. Like he's fought with his we- his weapons quite often. Like he's done hand to hand combat with the bow on many occasions, and they have all these people attacking him. And when they get hit, they're just dropping to the floor. I know Clint was told he had one free hit. Um, <laughs> so, but he definitely gets hit about five or six times. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. On the way up there, and he's going, I don't care. I need to have a conversation with this <laughs> exactly. guy. Exactly. Uh, it was really good. And, it, and I do like, you're right, Chris. I like I like that it ends with him, him having a conversation with Grills, this, uh, the guy who's taken the, uh, the Ronan outfit. And Grills says to him, well, did you enjoy yourself? And Clint kind of responds saying, yeah, it was fine. Um, you know, and off he goes and he, and he gives girls some extra respect saying, call me Clint, you know, so he's made a friend there. Um, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if we have this member of the FDNY back in a later yes. episode. I know? hope so. Yeah. This is a New York firefighter. He could come in useful as the series goes on. So, uh, so yeah, I don't think it's the last we'll see of girls. And I think it was a, a really good fun scene to put. It, it's always kind of the fish out of water thing. You know, it, it's not just that Hawkeye fought Thanos. He's also in his fifties and not willing to put up with this stuff. He just <laughs> exactly. wants a conversation with somebody that stole his suit and wants to get it back and deal with it in the episode the way it was done. It, it's effectively the brother to. When did everyone start saying I love you three, you know, loads of times on the phone? It, it's just really great. And I, I yeah. again, Jeremy Renner is a star. He's doing it really oh, well. God, doing it really, yeah. really well. Um, but interestingly, when he gets the suit back, you see him going and stashing it in a New York gym locker. No specific special place. This was literally a locker in a gym in New York. There doesn't seem to be any particular connection with anything. And I know we had that conversation. That's what Kate was saying. Is there no, like... Avengers place left in New York where we can, where, where I can go into the safe house kind of thing. But I just thought it was interesting that it's just, it seems like a regular gym locker. I know the lock itself that he puts on the door is his own lock that he brings with him, but it's an, it's 
an odd moment that he hasn't got somewhere at all to stash stuff in New York. So I I thought the same thing, and then it was we do know that there has been loads of different drops, drop zones, safe houses for shields and shield agents and things like that. Um, from Black Widow to um, even kind of similar things kind of are mentioned um, in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And maybe it's one of those, yeah. So I think like it could be like it, on the facade, it's a gym and for everything else, it's fine, but it's actually well monitored kind mm. of gym, but it's just he puts on a lock yeah. or kind of hiding it in plain sight is yeah. usually a good thing yeah. as well. Um, he just has to pay his fee in the membership. That's all. Exactly, could could just be that. Um, uh, but I also love the conversation that he has with uh, with his wife Laura here uh, on the phone because I love that it's a coded conversation. Remember, everybody in the Avengers was surprised that Clint was married and had kids. Yeah, and his kids were reasonably old when we met them for the first time in uh, Avengers: Age of Ultron. Um, but Laura's had to deal with this her whole relationship really with clint so i love that there's these this kind of code of conversation of how long is it going to take i know that you have missions sometimes that you have to do i know you're you're in the life here you need you need to deal with this issue and then come back home you know i love that she's fully on board with what he needs to do because she absolutely knows he wouldn't put this before his kids if it wasn't massively important yeah yeah um so it's just a little bit of their relationship again the the other thing that i kept thinking in my mind was Shaun of the Dead where they're in the Winchester bar and it's like we'll have a couple of pints here and it'll all blow over Mm -hmm. you know and it's the same thing with Clint it's like it's only going to take me a day you know this is this is just this isn't going to be anything too serious Mm -hmm. or too big you know I'll be back in a day and I I'm I'm hoping that there is the running joke through the next few episodes where Oh, it's going to take two days. And we're going to still have the phone call with Laura where he's having to make the excuses whilst, mm-hmm. the, you know, the kids are on the city watching the movie Marathon or something like that. You know, we see them doing the, the gingerbread yeah. uh, house building here. So I, I really, um, I hope that is a running gag. I've set it up in my own head. So if we don't get it, I can just go in another reality, I guess, <laughs> uh, and, 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 and laugh internally there you go there you go and another another reality where there's an ongoing joke but i but i like that laura understands it's not it's not like the the normal trope of this kind of stuff where he's hiding his secret identity from his partner and has to make up excuses she knows and she she knows he would only put this up front if it was really important i thought that was really uh, refreshing actually I, i really enjoyed that absolutely it's especially the catch and release she goes what's your plan catch and release oh really okay like he literally he tells her the, his plan. Yeah, not only and that, she's she like, actually says right. that's a Natasha move. You're going to use yeah. one of Natasha's moves, mm-hmm. so she knows everything about their relationship, um, which is which is really good. I like, I really like that. Uh, I think that's it for our, our arrow point number one. Uh, let's get on to arrow point number two because the other side of this coin really is is Kate and what's going on with her and her family uh, relationship in the episode. Um, just to kick it off, though, I like that we do have Clint bringing her back her to her um mother's work to uh, bishop securities where her, the the company that her mother owns and i like that we again see a bit of the hawkeye um agent of shield clint barton here where he basically takes about an extra hour to get her from her apartment to her mom's workplace because he's taking her down different alleys making sure she's not being followed <laughs> yeah and that's a callback um because the reason why the at uh, Tracksuit Mafia Fender is because she went to her apartment and then back out on the street. So he's telling her, next time, if you're going to be followed, this is how you get rid of anybody that's following you. So he does teach her stuff there. But he taught her one thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. How not to be tra- trailed. And yeah. I kind of had a good idea about that anyway. But she didn't. She says no, that, I, but she I didn't know. have an idea. She was followed home by the Tracksuit Mafia. But as I said... And, and burnt down her house. <laughs> and how to stitch herself up properly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which was really good. That's really I did good. like her with the pizza on the head as well to, to, yeah. to take the swelling down. Yes, she's multitasking. She's also, also defrosting breakfast for the dog. <laughs> <laughs> like that. Like that. Really good. Uh, and then we also have the, the branding discussion with Hawkeye. And as you said, he's not really comfortable with the idea of, of people calling him hero and not really comfortable with his brand, I suppose, as, as Kate would put it. 
I love that moment where we have all the people dressed up as superheroes in the street, including all of the Avengers and um, Katniss Everdeen, who came to think <laughs> could possibly be our guy. Uh, <laughs> really like that. It's a, a good, funny call out. Uh, but Kate just thinks that he's just not on the branding. He He's someone that clearly inspired her and can be an inspiration to other people. Yeah, you're you're too low key, <laughs> which I like. He he's a spy. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, in that moment, uh, Clint leaving Kate behind and, and giving her the phone number. Another little great uh, bit of banter between the two of them, where uh, where Kate's kind of going, "Oh, I'll give you a call later." And he's like, "Please don't, don't don't call me. It's for emergencies only. I will block and delete if I <laughs> if I feel you're using the the privilege." <laughs> and then we get the kind of big battle really in the episode between Kate and Jack. It's kind of a battle of wills. Um, to be or given. wits to a degree uh, at some point as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not too sure how uh, how much wit Jack has. Um, <laughs> not too set on him. I know Kate's very intelligent, but I'm not too sure about Jack uh, in this episode. Uh, certainly, but I like that. You know, she kind of interrogates him in the office, um, starting out with. Um, she's obviously had a, had a bit of a bit of psychology one on one. She starts out with um, apologizing to him and 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 commiserating uh, to him about the loss of his uncle, and then uh, then goes in with the questions um, because she's convinced she's seen the dead body of Armand. She knows that this person has been stabbed, um, and how many people are going to use a sword in New York City to kill somebody is is what she says to her mother later on. So she knows that Jack has a penchant for swords. So. Uh, why not probe him as much as possible? Well, that's it. I, I, this brought me back to, um, back to Eleanor again, because we knew they had financial troubles beforehand. There was this, it's all built on a lie from Armand. And I'm just wondering, is she marrying, um, Jacques to get part of the inheritance? I, I just, I don't know, but I'm still there mm-hmm. going, Oh, Eleanor, you crafty so and so. Um, but it could it's, all just be, uh, Jacques Decane, um, for sure. It could be, could be. That's where everything's pointing right now. Yeah. Um, including the, the butterscotch toffees. Well, yes, absolutely. I didn't know what the importance of those butterscotch toffees was at all. <laughs> no. It was even included in the, uh, in the opening. And it was like, <laughs> because, because Kate had said it, it just sounded like, wow, rich people and their monogram butterscotch toffees. <laughs> you know, is this, is that how, how rich you have to be to get your own monogram toffees? Um, but it does make sense, uh, later on in the episode when Armand pulls one out of his pocket and she'd just seen them in the bowl the previous night. So she knows he's probably been over at the house pretty recently. But at the same point, he's he's the fifth. He's a Dumont. He, of course, he's going to be with his uncle's house. They didn't seem to have that great a relationship, which is what she saw in the first episode. She saw they're kind of at each other's throats a bit. Yeah. Um. So she's kind of piecing it all together, and that's that's what I'm kind of guessing from from here. Again, um. Not sure yet. I hope it's not as as simple and straightforward as this. Oh, he killed his uncle. We knew that. I killed him with a sword. That's kind of it. <laughs> or did the mum do it? Exactly as John's would say. Well, that's yes. it. Yeah. Or is that too simple? You know, is it? You know, we're introduced to a a new antagonist here. Maybe there's something there. She's one of the powerful friends that Oman was talking about. Yeah, so. Maybe. There's still plenty of options. The terrible, uh, powerful sure. friend of our mom's if she stabbed him and killed him. <laughs> well, a back, backstabbing very friend. Very powerful friends who might stab me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> please don't. Um, just one thing to mention that you, we kind of mentioned the money, money troubles of, uh, of Eleanor. Um, really interesting. She's living in the same apartment in New York. So, uh, that apartment was rebuilt after the attack in New York. Um, it was a very expensive apartment, uh, to begin with because they were having money troubles back in 2012, but she's been yeah. able to hold on to it. Yeah. Um, just like her husband Derek had said, something did fall out of the sky that allowed them to keep the apartment, whether that was insurance, insurance. money um, <laughs> from overall getting uh, New York restored, or maybe it was life insurance from uh, from her husband. Or both. Or both. Or uh, both. It, okay. it, I needed both to exactly. be honest. It's a very rich, expensive looking apartment. Is she trying it all over again with, with Jack? Oh, maybe. Who knows? Maybe. Ooh. She's a, she's another type of Black Widow. Yeah, could be a con. Yeah, yeah, could be. Uh, what did you think of the fencing fight uh, between Jacques and uh, and Kate? I loved it. I yeah. thought it was really good. Um, and I loved as she takes the, the fencing sword from from Jacques right at the end and it spins around. I, I, get, I don't know whether that was by accident or they you know did that scene about a thousand times mm-hmm. to get that that look, but it... 
yeah, it was just really good. And, you know, you see a bit more of her skill. Mm-hmm. Um, but you also get the sense, you know, Jack is pretty nifty with a fencing sword as well. Absolutely. But he, he does, um, underplay it as she's trying to prove to show that, you know, this guy does lie and could be lying about, um, how his, his, his uncle got, got stabbed. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a, I, I get the feeling this is going to be kind of the big reveal at the end is that the mum and Jacques are like kingpins of the underground. Okay. And they're, they've, they were involved in nefarious things and the mother has been for years. Um, and that's why she didn't mind the dad going and she's just why she's shocked. <laughs> that's why she shacked up with shock. Right. <laughs> I like that joke, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's why we're on the same way as that. I know. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I feel like if that's the reveal, that's probably going to come next episode. Um, cause that feels like a, a pretty straightforward premise to hang six episodes of a show on. So I think it's probably going to come pretty quick because Kate already suspects Jock right now. Yeah. So, uh, so I think we're probably going to find out that bit of the story next episode and there'll be uh, hopefully lots more story to go uh, by the end of the season but hopefully um, but I, I thought it was a really interesting little fight between the two of them again it's kind of Kate showing she can not only battle with words she can also battle uh, with swords as well so yes. uh, and her and her bow and arrow so um, yes yeah, she's pretty pretty talented old Kate. it's Jock at the end that that just the flick of the wrist yeah to that disarms her mm-hmm. that's the one where you're like oh yeah, cool. definitely. Yeah. Um, the character in the comic books has uh, lots and lots and lots of history. Um, so it'd be interesting to see how much they play into this, how much they take. Yeah. Um, and I suppose we will. It will kind of parts of this will be played out over the coming episodes, and depending on where this, I, I'm hesitant to give too much backstory of the comic book character because I want to see where this goes. If closer towards the end of the episode. We've seen they've wildly, wildly veered left or right, um, or they've kind of revealed a lot of it. We can give some comic book context in Chris's corner later, um, but it, I just we need to be somewhat careful. We're two episodes in, so we don't want to inadvertently ruin anything <laughs> for anyone. I well, feel like they've probably just taken. I feel like they've probably just taken the mustache and swords. To be honest, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm, I would be quite shocked if they took uh, some of the storylines because they're quite intertwined with very much younger versions of uh, of the characters here. Well, <laughs> I, I for one can say I will not be ruining anything yeah. because I have no idea. I have no idea. So don't say a word, Chris. So I go. won't. I'll just twirl my mustache <laughs> villainously. <laughs> uh, yes, Zorro. I think that's it probably on our hour point number two. And we've kind of spoiled our hour point number three because the hour point number three was really supposed to be about Clinton Case getting captured by the tracksuit mafia and the big reveal of who the leader is. But we kind of spoiled that at the synopsis. Uh, but yes. so let's talk Sorry. quickly about the capture of uh, Clinton Case. Chris, you already mentioned that he's using Natasha's catch and release technique, a technique that we saw used by Natasha in Avengers, where she's sitting in a room surrounded by uh, by Russians, pretending she can't speak Russian, learning every piece of information out of them. Uh, so he's using it again on this uh, on the tracksuit mafia uh, to get captured. He did get an old uh, an old baseball bat to the stomach. Um, oh yeah, it looks taken, like it hurts. So, yeah, but I like I like the little call out from Jeremy Renner uh, when he gets bundled into the back of the van. You just hear a little voice going, "I can see through the mask," <laughs> which is a, a fun little gag. And of course, another fun little gag. After after Kate has, find, has, has kind of discovered what's happening and wants to share the information with Clint, she um, gets is able to get in contact with uh, with Clint and track his phone because of her mother's technology, because of uh, of Bishop Securities. She's able yeah. to track his phone and find out where he is. But we get a great moment where she's standing above and they're calling uh, calling out Clint. They're trying to interrogate him, trying to find out where Kate Bishop is and. She falls in through the window. Uh, <laughs> that to, was great. To the sounds of Ivan, who's the the one who's been uh, interrogating um, Clint, going, 
I found her. <laughs> she <laughs> the floor. Very funny. Great timing. Yeah. Uh, like the lot. It was even better with just the, the additional, oh, we're doing the gun things. Was I supposed to bring one? Like, <laughs> yeah, like, exactly. Like, again, it's just that fun and like Clint going, can, can I speak to management? Uh-huh. Like, I know, like, I, I feel like I'm just speaking to like, Furniture. So the, in the furniture here. Uh, Can I speak to someone in charge? Yeah. And it's just like, no, no, you, you look at us. You look at me. I mean, uh, you look at us. All of us. All five of us. Yeah, it was really good. I love that. And I, I, I love the, um, <laughs> just the, the Russians taking offense, uh, by, uh, by Clinton talking about the state of the warehouse and he starts just he just goes on that ramble about do you know how difficult it is to get good warehouse space <laughs> these days <laughs> Be, they're all being bought up for new condos and conversions uh, so it's just like oh classic do you know and that's and that's a great call out because um when we used to watch the defender shows the ones on netflix everybody had a warehouse every every bad guy had a warehouse that you take them to in comic books it's really well known but the kind of joke about it is all of those stories were written back in the 70s when Hell's Kitchen was a rundown area of the city and there were loads of warehouses in the city, um, which you absolutely wouldn't be able to get in New York. You know, property is at an absolute premium in New York, so the chances of you getting these disused warehouses are so low. So, so a great little gag there about uh, about the state of New York now, because there was that kind of idea back in the Netflix days that, you know, Daredevil wouldn't have... Uh, that kind of city to run around in that he had back in the back in the seventies. So, um, well, that, well, that's it, and the Luke Cage part on gentrification as mm-hmm. well. Like, yeah, you know, so yeah, good stuff. Exactly. I think that's it on our arrow points uh, for the episode. Anything else that you want to call out for the episode, guys? Um, I just have one note, um, and that's in the first episode. Kate pulls out this tracking software, and I was like, going, mm-hmm. "Oh, hang on a second, you know, what's that about?" But it is ultimately her her mother's um company's software, uh, yeah. Bishop Securities. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that was just something that kind of got explained in this episode. So yeah. it was just that was just one of the notes I I kind of wanted to bring up because it was kind of weird in the first episode. Yeah, it she tracks was. down Armand by going home, opening her phone, and running back out the door again. It's yeah. like, hang on a second, yeah, you need well, a little bit of of uh, of hacker style typing on a computer, don't you? No, just needs to touch the phone, and she can track any phone in the all of New York. But, but that's it. The app looked like yeah. it would be from one of the Black Widows or from Shield, and I was like, going, okay, what is going on here? Mm-hmm. Um. You know, is she, is she playing it sort of less competent uh, in front of Clinton because she is already in um, something like Shield or yeah. or Sword or whatever? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to quote this episode um, from uh, Hawkeye, John, and say um, you can call him Clint if you'd like to. You don't have to give him his full title of Clinton. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> John's made up a, a longer version of his name for this exactly. episode. <laughs> Isn't that what us Brits do? Always yeah. make names longer. Make names longer, exactly. Exactly. Uh, I'll quickly just add one that we missed and didn't call out in the very first episode. Uh, the tower uh, was Stain Building. Yes. Um, that was the college building. We can assume Obadiah Stane. I presume it was family, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So That's I true. just said it was a nice call out, just Obadiah Stane from the Iron Man one. The first no. ever Iron Man, yes. That's a nice nice one. Um what we did get in this episode was uh what caused um the hearing loss of uh, of Clint Barton. Um, yes. uh, that was good. <laughs> which, that was a good was montage. Just done as a montage of explosions. Look, you know, he's a he's he's a superhero <laughs> uh, with no superpowers, um, stuck in situations that uh, that even the uh, even the ones with <laughs> massive superpowers uh, come out with injuries from. So, of course, it would make sense that he may lose his hearing from uh, from that. And finally, I just wanted to call out Eleanor's plan for Kate and what she has planned for the rest of her life. <laughs> Kate Bishop has been training at every single possible discipline. And it's not like, you know, and we'll send you off to the Olympics next year (laughs) or something. Like, she's so talented and has won so many different awards for everything that she's done. And her mom's plan for is, you'll finish college and come working for me. Close your eyes for a few years and you'll realize (laughs) that you're in the right place. Like, how boring is that life? Uh, Yeah. No no wonder she has problems with yeah. <laughs> yeah, but no wonder she has problems with Eleanor. Like, absolutely, that's that's not the greatest vision for your daughter uh, that you could have imagined. I, I would definitely, have, if that was my daughter, I would definitely be putting her up for um for the Olympics uh, without a doubt. She's won every single other medal. Why not get her onto the Olympic team? Yeah. 
She's aged out. <laughs> it's only 22, Chris. What are you talking about? Aged out. Just got to at least 15 more years to get into the Olympics. <laughs> yeah, and it is something like archery. It's not the 100 metres. That's I'd, true. That's I'd true. say she could probably right. do just that Just needs too. a steady hand. Yep, she probably just needs a steady hand. And she's definitely got that. We've already seen that uh, throughout this episode. That's it. That's probably it for our discussion about episode two. Um, did this episode hit the mark? Chris, do you defend Hawkeye episode two, hide and seek? Oh, I see what you did there. Well done. <laughs> Well, you missed it in the first episode. Know, exactly. <laughs> it was on target then, the first episode. This episode's hit the mark. I really enjoyed this. It hit the mark for me um, for multitude of reasons. More the 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 tone of the show, the the what we can expect from the next couple of episodes has really much been settled, and it's kind of the the it, it's you un- we understand the action now, the comedy, the the the, the timings. The, the the delivery between the two are Hawkeyes, or the the one Hawkeye and the the budding Hawkeye, mm. um, so it really just kind of came together uh, in a way that now I'm like, okay, I know what I'm getting, and I'm enjoying what we're what you're giving me. Um, I can see the the great why they put two of them together again. Obviously, not just for finishing Christmas week, but also just it really shows you. It sets up so many questions. Like, and you're like, you want to know what the next four episodes, what is the story with Jack? Like, who did kill it? Where is Ronan's sword? Like, what's going to happen with Jack's Mafia? Who is the strange lady uh, listening to music with her hand in front of the speaker? Mm-hmm. All of these types of things that you're going to go in and go, oh, cool. I want to know more. Like, give me, give me it. So overall, completely hit the mark. Bullseye as a package. Take me on to episode three. Excellent. How about you, John? Do you defend Hawkeye Episode 2, Hide and Seek? Uh, yeah, I really do. Uh, I defend uh, Episode 2, Hide and Seek. I give it four crispy fire damage departments out of five. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I loved um, the fact that, for me, it, it showed that dynamic, as Chris said. You know, th- th- being a double header, um, having this second part really kind of so it made me mellow out uh, because I loved the pitter patter uh, between Clint uh, and Kate. Um, and, you know, from Kate dropping through the roof and the whole interrogation comedy, but just leading to that really kind of nice, um, sort of threatening view of Maya Lopez uh, as this mysterious, um, Echo mm-hmm. um, was really, really good. Uh, I loved the whole um, LARPA scene uh, with Grill. And I just, yeah, I absolutely just thought that was so funny and um, so, so genuine. And again, just his, his Clint's relationship with Laura, his wife, it just felt refreshing to me. Like you mm-hmm. say, they're totally in and has skin in the game with her husband, knows the business that he's in, um, and knows what the situation is. Um, and I just thought that was superb. Um, I think the, um, you know, the battle, uh, in the apartment, if only all our homes had space enough to do a fencing joust and um, yeah, push back the table we'll have we'll do, do <laughs> exactly yeah. uh, we'll do it with cocktail sticks um but i it was just uh you know i really like that it's kind of it's a bit more intrigue i'm still not entirely sure whether i'm there but i, I i'm kind of tending towards eleanor um who's probably going to stab uh jack in the in, in the back uh to be honest but i you know i like the fact that kate is is the you know she is like pizza dog with with a pizza and she's she's got it for for jack and i do like that he points it out is it because she was surprised by the engagement that it was dropped on her in in that way effectively told by armand so you know there's, there's a kind of a nice dynamic with, with um kate and effectively you know these two distant people of jack in particular and the person who should be less distant but is uh, with with eleanor mm-hmm. so um yeah i really do defend this episode and um, give it four uh crispy fire and 
Crispy and crunchy. Fire damage uh, apartments out of five. And dare I say, I think, you know, I would tend towards a more um, sympathetic four for the first one after seeing both of them together gotcha. as well. Yeah. Excellent. So an even higher score for the first episode. Exactly. Episode. Look at me. Derek, um, did episode two of Hawkeye hit the mark? Yes, it did. Absolutely. It was really good fun. Really enjoyed it. Um, right on the, right on the money for me, uh, these two episodes. Um, and I've just thought of another explanation. I wonder if, uh, Jacques accidentally killed Armand. Remember, he got the Ronin sword, which is a click of a button and the blade <laughs> flips out. <laughs> um, oh, I've just solved it. Oops. <laughs> but I don't think he's as incompetent as he as possibly me. makes uh, out. I would definitely cut my own fingers off if I had a, a <laughs> Stab that yourself. You touch one button and it, and it pops out. Uh, what if you're holding it the wrong way around? Like, you know, um, not good. Not good. Uh, but no, I did really enjoy the episode. The banter between the two main characters, between Kate Bishop and Clint. Uh, Barton is just so much fun uh, to watch on screen, and I'm hoping that we're going to get a lot more of that uh, as the season rolls onwards. Good stuff. Let's go off to the pub. Get some nice refreshments after our discussions about the two episodes. Um, we're heading into our pub quiz. John, do you have a pub quiz question for us? I certainly do. I certainly do. Grab your fizzy, fizzy sparkling goodness for uh, the Christmas sparkle, I guess, uh, with your champagne or Prosecco, Carver, some kind of sparkling wine. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, lemonade. Well, lemonade, if you will, or fizzy water, if you won't. Um, but, yes, fellow quizzers, fellow defenders, uh, the question for episode two is, what is the number on the firefighter helmet that Clint is wearing? Uh, ooh, very good. Mm. Yes, you can send in your answer to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com uh, and you'll be in with a shout for the Hawkeye goodies mm-hmm. uh, that will be um, piercing their way through the atmosphere as we send them by arrow, um, of course, um, <laughs> well. to the lucky uh, person who has scored uh, the most points on this pub quiz uh, for Hawkeye. So just to repeat the question, what is the number on the firefighter helmet that Clint is wearing? Absolutely. Send all your answers into us by the end of the year, by the 31st of December, 2021. And uh, you'll be in with a chance of winning those Hawkeye goodies. Yes. But we would love to hear not just the, your answers, but also your feedback. You can email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com. You can join our Facebook page at facebook.com slash tvpodcastindustries. Why not actually join the group there? Facebook.com slash groups slash TV podcast industries where we do have spoiler posts for each and every episode. You can jump in. Not on Facebook. You want to talk to us on Twitter? No problem. We're there too at TV pod industries. We're even over on Instagram. If you want to get all the ground up and be down with the kids, you know, and give us the real clicks and likes and all those things. <laughs> I, swear I don't think hip. Instagram is for kids. Anymore. No, I don't think so. Not anymore. We're not on TikTok. Sorry. As soon, as soon as we went over to Instagram, they all moved on, I think. Exactly. That's usually <laughs> the way. Or if you want to hear your dulcet tones alongside ours, you can also record your thoughts in a voice message and email it to us at feedback at TV Podcast Industries or even go over to the website where you can record us a voicemail. And that website is tvpodcastindustries.com. We have... Loads of feedback for this episode, so we'll kick it off with an email from the one and only Coffee and Vodka. Coffee and Vodka started by saying, Greetings, holiday defenders. (laughs) From minute one, a tight story fitting within the MCU history, giving us the origin of Kate Bishop, complete with the prerequisite loss of her favourite parent. The title sequence provided a short and efficient montage of her training, and the bell terror scene was both humorous and effective in showing us her skill. Meanwhile, Clint... I'm too old for this. Barton couldn't be more ready to retire. I cringed right along with him as <laughs> Cap sang about he could do this all day. <laughs> the tracksuit mafia, the Draculas are great comedic foils. Hard to square that these seemingly incompetent bros with Mayor Lopez's leadership. Hopefully this means a kingpin appearance. Mm. So far, it's hard to take the swordsman seriously, but we'll see if they manage to make him a real threat. With the capture of both them in the final scene, I was mostly concerned about who would feed Lucky. 
Although Bishop's fall from the skylight was a trope the TV show could have done without, I found the rest of it solid. And after watching The Eternals, a welcome return to the MCU formulaic structure. (laughs) Finally, as they seem to have gone for that buddy cop theme, do you think they should have titled it something like Hawkeye and Bishop? (laughs) Coffee about to scores for episode one was five adjacent urinals out of five. And episode two was five pizza dogs out of five. Yummy. Peace and take care. Coffee and vodka. Yep. Don't get those two scores mixed up. No, no, not at all. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I can see why they would call it Hawkeye and Bishop. And it feels like in the same way that, you know, Falcon and Winter Soldier ended with it becoming Captain America and Winter Soldier at the end of the season. You wonder whether by the end of the season, having known Bishop, uh, or Kate Bishop, but by the end of the season, potentially, you could call it Hawkeye and Bishop. But, you know, the, nobody ha- would have known who Kate Bishop was. She hadn't been introduced to the universe. So, uh, and potentially by the end of the season, she will be Hawkeye. So uh, it would make sense if it just had the Hawkeye story. I think also if they just call it Hawkeyes, because in the comic book, uh, as part of the run, later on in the run, it becomes Hawkeyes. Um, so, right. which makes sense they'll just add an s on exactly kind of like it'll be the logo there'll be a sign with an s of something or that and season yeah. Out and yeah and it'll just be hawkeye yeah um yeah i agree with a lot of the stuff i am happy to be back in the as you put it formulaic mcu yeah. structure <laughs> see i hate formulaic mcu that's what bores me um i'm really glad they're doing what they want to do here with a buddy cop show like it is different we haven't had a buddy cop show uh, yeah, <laughs> MCU and uh, and the Eternals was fantastic. We all really enjoyed the Eternals, the three of us when exactly. we see it in, in the cinema. So uh, I'm glad that the MCU can turn their hand to whatever they want to turn their hand to. That's probably what I'd what I'd say anyway. Thanks so much for your feedback, Coffee Vodka. Over on Facebook, we had some feedback from Ronaldo from Into the Night, the Moon Knight podcast, who says just watch both episodes and already I think Steinfeld is perfectly cast. Great intro and a bit of intrigue with Kate's mom and new fiance. Comic fans know. But really loved the intro with a young Kate and got chills as she watched Hawkeye do that backflip from 2012. For those that have followed all the MCU films, it felt as if we were ourselves reliving that moment when we first watched Avengers Assemble. Really great stuff. Kate is so likable and I liken her to the kind, to kind of like Scott Lang in that they just seemed like really nice people. Very affable. Lucky the dog. Oh, stop it. Such an adorable dog. At set at Christmas, the tension of Clint making it home for his kids is a great tension builder. Tracksuit Mafia. Love them in the Fraction Run. Love them here. <laughs> I've quickly latched onto this show and it didn't take long at all to get immersed in the tone and fun of it. Stands out for me would definitely be the NYC LARP session and the innocent fun that Grills had in killing Clint. Hope Clint realized soon that plenty of people revere and appreciate what he and the Avengers did. The chat with Kate about how he was an inspiration for her was touching too. Other great moments were the fencing between Kate and Jack. Kate managed to find a crack in his armor, but of course Kate's mom would have none of it. Final big moment was the reveal of Echo as the main boss. She looks great and menacing. Can't wait to see how she develops into a character in her own show. So you probably can tell I'm loving this show at the moment. We are only just about to start seeing the two archers team up and I can't wait. Steinfeld's quirks and action acting chops are so damn impressive and Renner plays the grizzled hero so well. Oh, and yes, the hearing aid. Such a great thing to see in a show as both a callback to the comics and the fact that all that fighting, well, it makes sense that Clint would have be, would have come away with some damage. Can't wait for episode three. Thanks so much, Ray. Yeah, thank you so much, Ray. Um, yeah, it's completely with you. I think the adorable dog, I really <laughs> hope uh, it, it swallowed the watch because uh, I, I want to see this trio as well. Oh, there you um, go. Yeah. yeah, so... I was going to say the one thing I would complain about our podcast uh, is that we don't have enough adorable dogs on here. Um, it's well, true. Yeah, it's true. We, 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 we are we are cats. two households of cats. Yeah, yeah. We do have our podcasts at least. Yes, that's true. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Ray. I'm glad you're enjoying it. it. It is just that fun show to to get us through till the till the Christmas period, isn't it? Exactly. We have some more feedback from Diana Debreen Maskell. She says this was a great holiday watch while our turkey was in the oven may become an annual event. Mm. I love the chemistry and the humour, enjoyed the tracksuit mafia, although I was so worried about the role-playing thief. Apparently, the mafia isn't on Instagram. (laughs) I also love the 
that Clint complained about work grind previously. So his wife's response to the mafia was just not those guys. <laughs> uh, the only note I'm not sure about was the the mom stepdad plot. Hope it pays off because I was mostly bored by that. Thanks so much, uh, Diana. Yeah, I can I can get your your kind of um, your vibe actually about the the Mormon stepdad plot. And mm. um, I for me, I I feel like it's really quite transparent what that might be all about. To be honest, but yeah. as you say, maybe it will pay off. And and I guess with the more ominous echo. And then the, the, there is a different kind of element here being brought in yeah. or connected to um, the uh, Eleanor and Jack's uh, story as well. Yeah, I'm hoping we get the the traditional TV podcast industry's twist where we think something's going to happen and then it doesn't at all. <laughs> yeah, well, we get it entirely <laughs> yes. wrong. Uh, but thanks so much, uh, Deanna. Uh, Donald Dennis says, it was good. But it is my least favorite Marvel MCU series to date. Oh, interesting. Yeah, no, that, I mean, and, and fair enough. I, as I say, I, I guess I took a while to warm to it, mm. and, and again, it, it depends whether this is in your kind of wheelhouse. You know, yeah. um, it, it, it may not be, yeah. um, or so else it may just build up as the episodes go on. You never. Well, know that is true. Gonna Who, knows? Who knows? Who knows? But uh, thanks, Donald. Thanks, Donald. Uh, Jeff Childs says, I have my Halloween costume for next year already. There were six of us watching this episode of Hawkeye. We are going to wear tracksuits and say bro a lot. (laughs) (laughs) Tracksuit mafia mafia for the win. Excellent stuff. Uh, Thanks, Jeff. Um, Over on email, we got some feedback from Victor Von Doom. Victor says, Greetings, Derek, John, Chris, and fellow defenders. This series has already replaced Die Hard as my favorite Christmas action thriller. Ooh, wow. Ooh that is a very big claim. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, well, well, you'll ha- you must be certain, Victor, uh, for sure on that. Um, so uh, we'll definitely roll with it. Um, Victor continues. I like the concept of the story progressing towards Christmas Day. Will Hawkeye make it home by then? Six days to go. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I especially enjoyed the scene of Hawkeye and f- and his family at the theatre. Uh-huh. He complained Ant-Man wasn't even there, but actually he was in the comics. Ooh, yes. Haley Steinfeld is killing it as Kate. She and Jeremy Renner really play well off each other. Mm-hmm. Definitely, completely agree with you there. Um, I'm loving, loving their dynamic. Uh, Victor says, I would like to see Kate and Shang-Chi hook up. Interesting. That would be a good hook up, I think. <laughs> yeah, that, that could really work. I shuddered at the appearance of Tony Dalton as Jack. The Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul has stood up on the back of my neck. Warning. Ooh. I haven't anticipated Christmas this much since childhood. As always, looking forward to your podcasts and Defenders feedback. Excelsior, Victor Von Doom. Uh, really thanks so much victor for the feedback and um, yeah i i um i never really got into breaking bad mm-hmm. and i haven't watched better call saul so um it the, and the character uh, of jack and tony dalton who plays him and um, yeah i i don't really know so that's that is a, is it a spoiler almost victor <laughs> about with the warning signs and um, but certainly we know that he is um uh, go, you know, is at least at a certain level swordsman. However, yes. that plays out whether it's just the name tag mm-hmm. or um a bit more um than that. Yeah, he's certainly hiding his identity, and and in that kind of moment with the uh, fencing bit with Kate, uh, certainly his true self came out for a second there, and I'm sure we'll see uh, more of that in future. Uh, the way he's kind of pandering um to eleanor throughout the last couple of episodes doesn't feel like the massive villain of the show but i feel like we're going to see a very different version of jock by the end of the season or jack by the end of the season well that's it and his mustache is very very distracting it is yes. it, it really is and <laughs> even in november that mustache was very well that's it. <laughs> it it certainly is going against trend mm-hmm. i would say well as i say a trend for november but by December, he'll want to have shaved it off. Well, yes, <laughs> Ho- hopefully. And Victor, thanks so much. Um, I'm really glad you're looking forward to the podcast. Mm-hmm. As always, uh, we really appreciate and look forward to getting your thoughts um, 
uh, on the episodes Absolutely. with your feedback. So thanks so much, Victor. Thanks, Victor. Finally, we have some feedback from Brandy Lise Anderson, who says, I have to say, I hope they don't do any post credit scenes until the last episode of this season. The shows haven't really been u- utilizing them correctly. Falcon and Winter Soldier was by far the best. One Division's felt unnecessary, except the finale. And Loki's felt like a bit of a cop-out. They really could have had us sweating for a week and the pay would have been so much better. And I don't even count Loki's finale with that final scene. <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? They have the opportunity to do a post credit scene on every single episode, but it feels like Marvel know that they're torturing people enough by yeah. putting an episode on every week that they want to give you extra torture, you know? Uh, so they give you a, pre- a, a moment like Echo before the credits so you don't have to worry about it, right? That's yeah, indeed definitely. Hope. Thanks so much to everybody who sets us in feedback. Again, as Chris mentioned, you can email us to feedback at TV Podcast Industries with any of your thoughts or go over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash TV Podcast Industries. This is just the beginning of the Hawkeye Podcast on TV Podcast Industries. We'll be back next week to discuss episode three of Hawkeye, but we'll also be back on TV Podcast Industries later this week at 5 p.m. GMT on Saturday, in fact, (laughs) uh, to discuss The Wheel of Time, episode four, Dragon Reborn. It is good. It is good to be me right now. Marvel and Wheel of Time in one week. Mm -hmm. It does mean a lot of podcasting, but you know what? It's worth it. Definitely. It is um, really good to have Marvel back up on Disney Plus with mm-hmm. Hawkeye. And it's great to see um, the Wheel of Time on Prime, um, for sure. Yeah. And they may be bringing Matt's Mass Effect, which will be <laughs> amazing. It'll be so, so good. But thanks so much for joining us, fellow Defenders. We'll, of course, be back next week with our array of podcasts. Um, it is a pleasure speaking with you as always about Mm -hmm. all things marvel all things hawkeye Uh, and remember keep watching keep listening and keep defending bye bye